through the precious gift of the Spirit, awe and wonder. Each one of us is daily presented with countless manifestations of the beautiful, and every such encounter allows us access to the one, of, one of the most precious things of all, the truth. For as Aquinas reminds us, beauty is the attractive power of truth. The beauty of architecture is that it is able to speak the truth in a way that no other art is capable of doing. Architecture touches us in every aspect of our lives and as such has the potential to be the most vivifying of all the arts. For good reason it has been called the greatest of all the arts and the mother of all sciences. Far better than any other art it is capable of speaking the truth about the nature of the human condition and of the world, rejoicing in the mysteries of both. It has reached astounding levels of perfection in this, producing timeless monuments to the God-given ability of its makers to fly terrifyingly close to the white hot centre of the source of all life and knowledge, the all-powerful, eternally creative Godhead. An attribute we consciously or not acknowledge and admire in architecture is its ability to speak in a timeless manner of ever-present realities. To be timeless is to stand outside of time, to touch the eternal. As impossible as this is for us, locked into this spatio-temporal domain, it remains our goal. We are constantly seeking that state of perfection for which we have been made in the image of our Creator. And thus, when an art form embraces the timeless, it is a pointer, a signpost for us on our journey back to our divine origin. The greatest architecture, while addressing the eternal, endeavours to be the most accurate expression possible of the time in which it is made. It responds in a timeless manner to the signs of its times. It is not excessively concerned about the past, which is historicism, or with the future, which is futurism, but it upholds the truth that we live in the eternal present, where the past, the present and the future are one. The theocentric view of the world, expressed so well by our opening quote from the Catechism, acknowledges that everything comes from God and is destined to return to Him. A theocentric view of the world accepts that the connection between the maker and what he has made is indissoluble, that an appreciation of this connection is our means of finding our way back to him, that this wayfinding depends on the application of our highest faculty, our intellectual intuition, to read the signs that he has left for us. It is this that has guided the hands and minds and hearts of those who have sought to make the best architecture down the ages. Architecture that addresses the whole human condition, spirit, mind and body, in a whole world that is understood to be similarly tripartite, having corresponding spiritual, mental and physical dimensions. And it is clearly demonstrable that the greatest architecture was produced by those who placed our last ends first where aggressing the spirit was an imperative above all others. It is regrettable, but not at all remarkable, that most practitioners and users of architecture today are fad followers, and that the latest fads say nothing of such an imperative. The history of Western architecture of the last 700 years shows a steady decline to arrive at this point. Judaic, Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Romanesque and Gothic architecture all place the utmost importance on these values. And from the 14th century, Gothic architecture turned gradually from its authentically spiritual origins, becoming more and more florid exercises in structural gymnastics. This was followed by the Renaissance, when architecture turned back to the contextually irrelevant Greek and Roman cultures for its pseudo-inspiration. The first 1,000 years of Christian synthesis were discarded 
to become disparagingly known as the Dark Ages, whilst we moved further and further away from the time immemorial sacred imperative that we seek to model our architecture on heavenly archetypes. From the 15th century, architects turned instead to temporal stereotypes in search of shapes for their buildings, and the age of revivalism had begun in earnest. Concerned with appearances only, with scant attention to the meaning and wisdom embodied by the architecture it replaced, Baroque, Rococo, Romanticism, Neoclassicism, Neo-Romanticism, Neo-Gothic, Neo-Baroque and Eclecticism <coughs> followed one another a morbid fascination with the past in the Battle of the Styles, a battle which, apart from a short period in the 20th century when modern architecture held sway, very sadly has carried us through until today. The respite offered by modern architecture was born out of a genuine search for truth. For the first time in centuries, with a steadfast faith in its own time, Architecture, tech, architecture took a dramatic turn away from the need to look backwards. It championed simplicity over unnecessary complexity, functionalism instead of blind adherence to stylistic tenets, and it married these to technology. Modernism reached its zenith in Jornitz and Sydney Opera House, the greatest building of the 20th century, a building that captured the essence of its place and time. A masterpiece of spatial arrangement and mechanised building systems, the Opera House is enlivened by embracing universal analogies. The rock-like base is to the hovering roof shells as ground, water is to sky as earth is to heaven. Before the computer became the ubiquitous tool it is now, the complex geometry of the building was meticulously hand-drafted in Utzon's office by young Spanish architect Rafael Maneo. With no equal, the Sydney Opera House marked the high point of modernism. Generally, though, unashamedly materialistic, modernism failed to address the whole human condition. As its proponents, highly skilled in dealing with the needs of the body, were ignorant or dismissive of the spiritual and barely cognizant of the mental needs of its users. This was not articulated but modern architecture was seen by the general populace as lacking something, that it was not speaking to them. The emphasis on the corporeal was responded to by those architects who took us then into postmodernism, which claimed to be addressing the mind through the comforting memories we have of the shapes of the architecture of the past, employing the fashionable pseudoscience of semiotics, it saw itself as needing to communicate meaning through the use of signs, where for modern architecture a portal needed to be no more nor less than a functional door through which one could adequately pass. Postmodernism turned to the portals of earlier periods and made shams of these, planting them on the building as one might on a film set. The portal is stripped of its essence and becomes nothing more than a billboard, a sign. Once more, the whole human condition, spirit, mind and body, was not addressed. Postmodernism quickly disappeared to be followed by a succession of the architectural isms, with the latest being pa pa parametricism, which is championed as being the new dominant architectural style. Using the exponentially increasing power of the computer to make very complex shapes, and by setting appropriate parameters, from where it derives its name, within which the computer is to work, it purports to be responding to society's increasingly complex social processes and institutions, where postmodernism was mainly speaking to the individual, parametricism lays claim to be addressing the needs of whole societies. It places great store in semiotics, seeing the main necessity of architecture to be that it communicates well. What is to be communicated, however, is just as lacking as it was for its architectural predecessors. 
remaining ignorant of the vivifying sources of knowledge to which the great traditions of the past would turn. Sadly, in this descent from the light of truth into the darkness of the depths in which we now find ourselves, some in the church have been and are actively complicit. Nothing demonstrates this more than what can only be described as the macabre revivalism practiced by some who are building pseudo-neoclassical churches. Falsely claiming their work is based upon the perennial wisdom of the Christian tradition, using deceitful building practices, their buildings merely have the appearance of the earthly stereotypes upon which they are based, failing entirely to learn anything from the heavenly archetypes so essential to the task. This is postmodernism at its worst, treating architecture as nothing more than a visual art at best. But more than that, as they claim to be making sacred spaces, whilst I am confident it is done with the best intentions, it is nevertheless blasphemy. If we are to arise from this abyss I have just described, nothing less than a total architectural revolution is necessary. And as it has done in the past, the church can and should lead the way. We here in Australia occupy a land whose original inhabitants understood their spiritual origins and whose lives were animated entirely by their concerns for maintaining their connection with their maker. No work of art, no artefact, no dance, no ritual could be other than sacred. The challenge that we as the inheritors of the tradition based upon the greatest spiritual revelation ever granted to humankind, living out our lives in the service of God and our fellow creatures in this land, is to endeavour to do the same, to make and do and live according to the divine order of creation as it has been revealed to us through our scriptures and through the book of creation, which the land on which we stand. We can begin by firmly rejecting the commonly expressed fallacy that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. A fallacy that springs from the dominating role of aesthetics, where beauty is reduced to the sensual pleasure experienced by the observer. As feelings differ for each of us, beauty tied to aesthetics is regarded as purely subjective. However, <clears throat> if we accept the traditional teaching that beauty is the attractive power of truth, it must be for us the means and the ends in all our endeavours. It will not be a mere matter of personal taste, as taste has no real role to play in sacred architecture. No matter if it is the taste of bishop, priest, architect or lay person, it cannot and must not be allowed to prevail over truth. <coughs> we perceive beauty by intellectual intuition, our spiritual faculty, that faculty which allows us to know immediately, needing no mediation by logical deduction when we are in the presence of the truth responding to two qualities that must be in all things beautiful, namely lucidity or clarity and harmony or fit. It comes from a Greek word which means fit. Lucidity will allow the most immediate and clear intellectual insight into the truth from a specific point of view, whilst harmony is a general attribute of all beautiful objects. They fit seamlessly and gloriously into their setting. A work of sacred architecture will fit harmoniously within and truthfully reflect the divine order of creation. The making of a work of sacred architecture is a mimesis of the creative act of God. The architect stands in for God, the divine architect. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. Psalm 127. 
For not only is God the supreme architect, he is the only architect. If we do not allow him to work through us in our making of architecture, our labours are in vain. For architecture is not a human invention, but an art God has taught us. Scripture abounds with evidence of this from the precise instructions given to us for the building of the ark, the tabernacle and the temple, through to the dazzling perfect image of the heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly archetype, archetype remains as our ultimate goal and inspiration. From the temple of Karnak to the pyramids of Cheops, from Angkor Wat to Borobudur, from Shash to Mont Saint-Michel, from the Forbidden City to the Temple of Heaven, from the Parthenon to the Pantheon, at every turn we are in the presence of those who place the concern with the spirit above all else. The sacred building is a prayer in physical form. To quote from my former Professor Peter Collar in his powerful little book, The Patterns of Delightful Architecture, which I would highly recommend if you read no other book on architecture, read The Patterns of Delightful Architecture by Peter Collar. Sacred architecture is then an act of sacrifice in its own mode, just as ritual or prayer is in theirs. As an act of sacrifice, its goal is to effect the transformation of man in the spirit, to come to know, to realise the spirit of truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you to the complete truth, says John 16, 13. By conforming to three sets of relative perfections, to the perfection of mankind, the perfection of the world, and to the perfection of the revelation, sacred architecture is an oblation and praise to the divine principle. Not merely an object of use, but a gift, an object of contemplation, a true inspiration. The making of a work of sacred architecture is a mimesis of the creative act of God. For the architect of a sacred building to come to an adequate understanding of the divine order of, of uh, creation is an endeavour that is clearly far from simple. It could rightly be the work of a dedicated lifetime made more difficult by the fact that our educational institutions, both secular and religious, have long since lost interest in the necessary knowledge. But this knowledge remains accessible. All it is lacking is the will to turn to it. There could never be a better time to take up such a challenge. Our age has been called the information age. We have at our fingertips literally all the information we could ever need. Ancient books preserved in our libraries have been digitised and what, what once would have required travelling great distances and gaining special permission to sit with them now it can be done on our devices anywhere at any time. We can effortlessly scroll through the precious works written on vellum that would have taken months and years of painstaking dedication and labour to, pr to produce. Untold millions of books are just a click away. Language is no barrier with instant translation tools at our command. For us, time and space have taken on a different meaning. We can visit virtually any place on earth with a few clicks and study it from almost any angle. The exponentially increasing power of the computer and our unquenchable search for knowledge combine to make this the most exciting time ever to be alive. For the architect, BIM, Building Information Modelling, is the everyday tool that permits vast amounts of information to, to be manipulated in a way never before possible. Parametricism is the logical extension of this. However, to rise above the willful meaninglessness that makes the avant-garde architecture of our age, where to crumple a piece of paper and throw it down, proclaiming it to be the shape of a building, and for a building to be built to that shape, where the self-expression of the genius architect is seen as the most important aspect of the building, the tools of the age need to be harnessed to truth. For the architect of the sacred building, this process must begin with a total acknowledgement that 
The physical world that is perceived by our senses is an illusion. Reality is truly the metaphysical world, beyond, outside and superior to the perceived world. This reality may be contacted by millions of ritual, myth and symbol. Sacred architecture has no higher goal than to be the setting and the impetus for this contact. The meaning of the building in its whole and in all of its parts is to be based upon the truths of the sacred tradition to which it belongs. Whilst meaningless in architecture holds sway with the architectural cognoscenti, meaning still remains a concern for some. However, the mode of discerning and discussing meaning remains virtually exclusively at the metaphorical level. The clever use of metaphor is possibly the highest goal of most contemporary architecture, whilst the other modes of discerning meaning at the psychic or mental level, analogy and allegory, are virtually unheard of. However, it is to the anagogical that the architect of the sacred building must turn to express the meaning of the highest order available to us. The highest order, the highest faculty is our intellectual intuition and it is this which is, in, is addressed by symbolism. Symbolism has, with very good reason, been called the specific vector of the sacred. The importance of the symbolic approach to knowledge in a spiritual tradition cannot be overestimated, and the role of symbolism in sacred architecture is utterly fundamental. It allows us to perceive every phenomenon, every phenomenon, whether tangible or intelligible, as dependent upon principles of ever higher orders of existence until ultimately its divine origin as a reflection of an aspect of the Creator. To perceive the world symbolically is to appreciate the total dependence of all things on their divine origin. Symbols are not inventions of human imagination, but are of divine origin to be discovered by the operation of the intellect. The modernist dictum, form follows function, shape determined by physical use, has had an incredibly powerful influence on our thinking about architecture. However, the Christian church, if it is to be true to tradition, cannot be so configured. To do so is to regard it as we would a secular building. And whilst a church building may be a, a religious building, have a, having a religious function, and perhaps even adorned with religious images. Unless it is rooted firmly in the sacred tradition, fitting harmoniously within and truthfully reflecting the divine order of creation, it cannot be a truly sacred building. No matter how beautifully performed the liturgy may be within it, no matter how seamlessly the architecture functions as a material support to the enactment of the liturgy, no matter how pleasing it is to the senses, it will be no better or worse than any secular building that is well arranged. That we are so readily inclined to build in this manner is the result of our living in a world where quality has been eclipsed at virtually every level by quantity. Scripture tells us that the Lord ordered all things by measure, number and weight. The divine plan ensures that the creative world comes about according to a preconceived order that unfolds by way of measure, number and weight. Order is not just one of the attributes of the cosmos, it is its essence, that without which it simply would not exist. Measure, number and weight <clears throat> in their quantitative aspect in architecture are geometry, mathematics and structures. The three being fundamental to the making of any architecture. But for the sacred building it is essential to understand that they are qualitatively inherent in the work of the divine architect. 
as the, da as the task of the architect of a sacred building is to make it a fitting symbol of the order of the cosmos, earnest prayerful reflection on the qualities of measure, number and weight is essential. Geometry literally is the measure of the earth. In the context of the principles of sacred architecture, measure is to be considered in it, firstly in its qualitative sense. For example, to take the measure of someone is to qualitatively, qualitatively sum them up. And by earth is meant the totality of manifestation in both its psychic and physical terms. In many languages, the word for architect is the same as the word for geometrician. Math mathematics is the application of number to the task of measuring. Number is used throughout scriptures in its symbolic sense. In human affairs today, we are familiar with it almost exclusively as purely quantitative, whereas Plato regarded it as the highest form of knowledge. In sacred architecture, number is the means whereby meaning is most efficaciously expressed. Zero. Nothing, and yet everything. It contains all number. One is a reflection of unity, of the unity of the Godhead, of the origin of all. Two can, can't be another one added to it. It must come from the one. So the one gives birth, as it were, to the two by a process of bifurcation. The two coming back together at give us the three. Four is the first squared number. At, by the time we get to five, we're, we're in the realm of life, a growth number. Six is a cyclic number, fixed and terminating. We, these, this wisdom is at our fingertips. It's in our very bones. And yet, we just look at numbers as pure quantity. For sacred architecture, it is crucial that the quality of number is the first and foremost thing to be addressed. The National Liturgical Architecture and Art Council of the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference published this little book in 2014, wherein we provided an introduction to the principles that are to be followed in the preparation, planning and construction of places of worship. The architectural principles are discussed under the headings Sacred architecture, the ordering Christological principle, appropriate symbolism, sacred imitation, open to the transcendent, and marriage of heaven and earth. And at a very quick look at what is covered in the book, you will see it addresses much of what we have just been discussing. Architecture to be practiced as a sacred art, not merely religious. Sacrosanctum Concilium calls us to show favour to truly sacred art, which is the highest achievement of religious art. The artist must be in love with the tradition. Truth, goodness and beauty are the hallmarks of marks of the sacred. Sacred architecture must imitate the divine creative act. The ordering Christological principle the Christian church building, if it is to be true to the tradition, must be based upon a Christological formative principle. Understood correctly, the Christological principle will not suggest any particular architectural arrangement. It could be just as effectively the principle governing a liturgy, a sacred song, a prayer, or any other human handiwork made in the honour of Christ. The church building is the material manifestation of the kingdom of Christ. Christ is the form, the pattern. Christ is the door. Christ is the way, the truth and the life. Christ is the foundation. Christ is the keystone. Christ is the cornerstone. In order for the Christological principle to be expressed in a church building, it must be the catalyst for devising a central idea for the building. And the central idea will then suggest a particular architectural arrangement. The 
possible architectural arrangements of a Christian church whose symbolism most faithfully aligns with the cosmological order and with the essential tenets of the faith are few in number but exceedingly fecund in application. A unifying central idea that springs from a thorough grasp of the Christological principle that is to form the basis of the building is essential. Every part of the building must be determined by this central idea. This requires much careful and prayerful discernment, but the unity, the goal of unity in the building must not be compromised. Appropriate symbolism. Symbolism is fundamental to an understanding of the sacred. Symbol references the divine source, scrupulously avoiding referencing only the human and or cosmic reflections of this source. Symbolism is not an invention of the human mind, but the God-given means of seeing the connection between all things and their divine origin. Sacred imitation. Sacred scripture abounds with symbolism that has always been informed has always informed the builders of our sacred architecture. There are appropriate numbers and ratios and, and so forth, and meaning is primary. The grand Complementary principles of essence and substance are reflected in pairs um, of as, such as unity and multiplicity, continuity and alternation, completeness and transformation. When wholeheartedly embraced and joyously employed in art and architecture, they give great depth and meaning to any attempt to imitate God the Creator. Essence and substance the primary duet, the one in order to become many, polarises itself into universal essence, the active aspect, and universal substance, the passive aspect of creation. And these principles are mirrored in countless ways throughout the whole of manifestation. And they can be appreciated in the antinomical qualities of form, sameness and otherness, unity and multiplicity, continuity and alternation, authority and dependence, completeness and transformation. The antinomical qualities of form are to be observed in all things. The world around us abounds with untold, seemingly endless applications of its ordering principles. Throughout the universe we find sameness and otherness singing joyfully together. The unity of this beautiful shell is supported by the multiplicity of its many parts all subservient to and playing their part in making of the whole the unified entity that it is. The many parts of this pine cone express continuity, where each part is like the next, but not exactly. No two parts are, nor can they, be the same. The rhythmic patterns of life depend on the juxtaposition of both continuity and alternation. Every entity, in order for it to exist, must have its own authority to do so, but that authority is not absolute. Nothing in existence has authority without dependence. The magnificent authority expressed by the soaring eagle is utterly dependent upon all of the elements that come together to allow it to fly as it does. Every entity that appears to be complete is always in a state of transformation, not just being, but always becoming, even if imperceptibly. And the best architecture will always rejoice in these antinomical qualities, reflecting the order that governs the created world, while celebrating the patterns of human life that pulse through it. The sacred building, made in the image of Christ, priest, prophet and king, and in the image of his kingdom, the new cosmic order and world without end, must communicate transcendence and imminence both internally and externally. 
sacred architecture directed towards the transcendent God, the natural hierarchy of the parts appropriately articulated to convey meaning, and the relationships of the parts to one another and the whole to be well understood and communicated. A reflection on the altar. The altar is Christ in our midst. Indeed, the altar is the church. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Corinthians. The altar is not simply the table for the Eucharistic banquet. It is also and firstly a stone, the stone of sacrifice. In a strict sense, the altar is a single natural stone resting on a base, also ideally of stone but as the germ allows of suitably no noble material. Its true form is a cube of small dimensions. Its celestial archetype is the altar of the heavenly Jerusalem, upon which the Lamb, immolated from the beginning of the world, is outstretched. It is the successor and synthesis of the Hebraic altars, just as the liturgy is a synthesis and sublimation of the sacrifices of the old law. Moses raised an altar at the foot of Sinai where the blood of the victim was offered, half to God, the rest serving to sprinkle the people to seal the first covenant. Upon the altar of the Christian church, the blood of the new covenant is poured out, offered to the Lord, then distributed to the people. The cosmic diagram of the cardinal directions is reproduced on the altar stone with five crosses, one at each corner and one in the centre. The corner crosses represent the cornerstones of the oriented church, whilst the central cross represents the foundation stone below and the keystone above. As, a scripture, as scripture attests, all of these stones represent Christ. The prototypical Christian church stands at the centre of the three-dimensional cross of manifestation. The altar is transfixed by the axis mundi, the pole of transcendence. From this point, the place of sacrifice where the sacred marriage of heaven and earth occurs the church extends into the fullness of the earthly plain, east, west, and north, south. The dome of the heavens above, the supernal sun beyond, the Godhead beyond all that is manifest. The body of the saint having died to the world becomes the spiritual seed planted in the darkness from which the church grows. The west-east axis is the horizontal equivalent of the vertical axis. The north-south axis the equivalent of the horizontal plane of the earth through which the divine vertical ray, the vertical divine ray passes at the centre. And so the marriage of heaven and earth must be clearly evidenced in the controlling geometrical configuration and in the nature fashioning and juxtaposition of the materials employed. The numbers, dimensions, ratios and proportions are to express the sacred union of heaven and earth while strengthening the expression of the central idea of the building. The symbolism attached to the ancient tradition of the marriage of the circle and the square in sacred architecture should be carefully studied and considered as the genesis of the geometry of the building. The principle of space is the point. The point is dimensionless and therefore only able to be represented in space by a dot. A dot is a small circle and a circle is a large dot. They are the least differentiated of all shapes and thus the best means we have of representing something that has no dimension. 
The circle, for this reason, is a very important symbol in sacred architecture. However, in its undifferentiated state, it is of little use to us. It needs to be arrested or terminated, and this is done by using the square. A point has 360 degrees. At the centre of the circle, therefore, there are 360 degrees. If the circle is quartered by its horizontal and its vertical axes, then we have 4 by 90 equaling 360 degrees at the centre. If the circle is now enclosed within the square, terminated by it, then we see that the 4 by 90 degrees at the centre reflected in the 4 90 degree corners of the external square, the square then is the exoteric expression of the esoteric point at the centre. The square is the only shape that has the symmetry of the point. The square and the circle together in this way are important to all traditions, not necessarily always explicit, indeed most often hidden in sacred architecture, but nevertheless always present. We do not inhabit a two-dimensional world. The square projected into space gives us the cube, within which is to be found the three-dimensional cross produced by the crossing of the three axes of the cube at right angles to each other. This configuration found within the cube, the first three-dimensional figure that arises naturally from the sphere, can be seen as the, body, as the geometry of the human body as well. Architecture today begins by determining the limits and boundaries and working in from there, from outside to in. For sacred architecture, the opposite is true. The act of making sacred architecture involves firstly a decision to establish a centre, a point on the terrestrial plane about which the architecture is to be arranged. From this point, the architecture will unfold in accord with the order that is understood to govern both the tripartite human condition, the microcosm, and the tripartite world, the macrocosm. Note that here in Australia, for us to act according to these sacred tenets, we must seek to understand the land as our indigenous sisters and brothers have done for millennia. The traditional ritual unfolding of the sacred building from its centre in the past involved setting up a pole or gnomon at the centre and drawing a circle around it. Often the circle would have been um, made using a string tied to the bottom of the pole and the length of the string would have been a, a sacred dimension, possibly taken from uh, something to do with the dedication of the church or something, perhaps even the height of the bishop, who knows, but it, would, it had a significance. And then this would have been, the circle would have been drawn. And then the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, would the shadow would cut two points on the circle, giving us the east-west um, axis, and then by a bit of beautiful geometry using the fish, we establish and we square the circle. And for the Christian, from the Christian point of view, the squaring of the circle represents the bringing to earth of the heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem is essential for Christian architecture, as it lies at the centre of the, de of the liturgy of dedication, and from it the church building draws all its fundamental meaning. Quoting from the uh, uh, dedication ceremony, the anointing of the church signifies that it is given over entirely and perpetually to Christian worship. In keeping with liturgical tradition, there are twelve anointings, or where it is more convenient for, as a symbol that the church is an image of the holy city of Jerusalem. We experience space and time as ever moving, as if in a constant flux of becoming, 
we are ever in search of being. The perfect image of this ultimate state of rest is the heavenly Jerusalem, where space and time are arrested. For the heavenly Jerusalem points to the transmutation of all time into a single present resting in itself. The angel measured 12,000 furlongs and 144 cubits, both solar numbers derived from the precession of the equinoxes, the greatest measure of all cosmic movements. The time it takes for two equinoxes to change position in the heaven of the fixed stars is exactly 12,960 years. 12,000, the great year of the Persian relates this duration to the solar year of 12 months, whilst 144 is a factor of 12,960. Thus, the heavenly city incorporates the whole of time by transmuting it, as it were, into space. The five perfect solids are the fundamental building blocks of creation in the microcosmic and macrocosmic orders. They are the only regular solids that the order of space will permit. We've known about these for millennia. I remember attending a lecture by the eminent uh, architect Keith Critchlow in England many years ago, where he showed us a, um, a, an icosahedron, which had been carved out of pure basalt, 8,000 years ago by an unknown culture somewhere in Scotland. Sacred architecture, as a true image of creation, is obliged to adhere to the principles that govern these solids. The architect ought to be well versed in the art and science of drawing from these solids the numbers, ratios and proportions appropriate for the task at hand. Just as all of the untold billions of configurations in the known universe re rely upon the geometry to be found within the only five regular solids that space will allow, the necessarily limited number of fundamental spatial arrangements in Christian architecture have been the basis of countless extraordinarily diverse and literally inexhaustible numbers of, buildings, of building configurations. The task for the architect of this specific church building is through a careful, prayerful process of discernment to seek out the appropriate Christological principle and thence to derive the controlling central idea from the building. As my colleague Paul Walsh notes, knowledge of the eternal form is impossible unless we know and love God. Evidence in the great works of the anonymous architects of sacred tradition and echoed in the words of Michelangelo, it is not enough to be, a great, to be a great and skillful master. One must also be a saint. In summary then, Christ is all in all. Meaning is paramount. Symbolism is essential and is not invented by man. If not symbolic, then diabolic. The order of creation must be the model for the order of the building. Goodness, truth and beauty guide and gu in the guide and goal in all aspects of the work. Thank you. inspiring to be in your presence and to have that sort of presentation. Um, questions? We have uh, time for questions. Virginia?
past and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And you showed a few pictures um, of some of these in the form of neo neo whatever, neo baroque, <laughs> neo romanticism, and saying they're not they're not that fantastic. I thought that they were beautiful. So what I'm curious to know is, uh, have there been any churches made recently that uh, follow the guidelines in uh, the booklet you kept referring to, that, that you like, that you approve of? No. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not to say that there are not people who are desperately trying to do this. Um, when we put out that little book, we put it out in the hope that it would be picked up and used with understanding and with love. There was a parish in Auckland in New Zealand that um, did that. I haven't seen the result yet, but the process, the process of discernment through which they went based on the, the book um, was sounded really good. So if they've ended up with a, a, a fine piece of architecture as a result, I'd be very happy. But I tried not to, let, to be too um, depressing um, by pointing out that we do live in the best time, but at the same time, we've got to acknowledge the reality of the world we're in. Once upon a time, the tallest building in the city would have been the church and the spa, what's our tallest building? The casino. The casino, <laughs> a temple to greed. That is telling us an awful lot about where we are and who we are. And we've got a lot of work to do if, we have, if we're going to counter that kind of terrible situation. Sorry, further to that, I just wanted, um, I loved your, <clears throat> sorry, essentially really speaking about this sacramentality, I suppose, of architecture. However, I was wondering, when you're talking about like the symbolism of numbers and um, the shapes, like Tor was saying about the older churches, um, like I know St. Peter's Basilica, a lot of the, um, as you would know, sorry, a lot of the architecture in the main um, section is based on the temple and the things that were prescribed in the Old Testament. And so I'm wondering, um, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, adhering to all those principles, but still um, we don't need to discard all the symbolism that has been used in past ages and that is scriptural in our, while still being, you know, um, open to translating it in our modern generation. I just wondered if you could um, clarify that, I suppose, in a way you say that. Would that make sense? Yep, thank you. Um, can I preface what I'm going to say by saying that the first time I walked into St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, I was utterly depressed, feeling that I'd entered a railway station or something similar. It has, for me, nothing of the sacred whatsoever. And when I look at the uh, beautiful building that um, was pulled down the, the, the Romanesque Basilica that was there that Charlemagne organised before um, the, the Renaissance ripped it apart um, it had everything but it, it wasn't good enough because the Renaissance said no, we're in the age of enlightenment we are now looking at the earth and uh, we're, we're looking down, we're not looking up we're looking about us, we're not looking up and we've gone on and on for the last 700 years doing exactly that. Um, which is not to say that there's not something good in everything, but let's be very, very clear where there is error to point it out. And um, to point it out forcefully. To understand the world symbolically is really what we're asked to do. We're asked to see in everything that we encounter and um, the beauty of God and the beauty of, uh, of creation. To look for the heavenly archetypes. What does that mean? 
It's an easy to roll off the tongue. Let's look for heavenly architect, archetypes rather than temporal stereotypes. To use an example that my former professor Collar used, if I'm driving down the highway and I see a sign with a cup on it, I am thinking that's a message for me that there's a cup of tea up the road somewhere, a cup of coffee. So it's a signification of that. But if I um, am prepared to see the cup as more than just uh, a sign that there's a cup of tea up there, if I reflect on what the cup is, and I think of the principle of the cup, I think of the principle of containment. And then if I think further, and I think, what does the principle of containment have to tell me about the heavenly archetypes? Then I'm immediately drawn to think of the Blessed Virgin Mary as the best symbol of containment that ever there was, for her body contained the precious Lord. It's that kind of thinking um, which comes naturally to those who are in a theocentric um, community. It's so hard for us with temples of greed around us everywhere. We take for granted things that are just erroneous. It's so hard for us to see symbolically. And yet that's what we've got to do. We're told we've got to do it. Um, I'm just going to, we've got a parishioner who's been watching this online and um, she's got a question here. Um, she says, thank you, that was very informative. She has two questions. Uh, one, you said that sacred architecture recognises the human condition and acts as a portal to reach spirit, mind and body. Are you saying that modern attempts to recapture beautiful architecture are blasphemous, i.e. Uh, the US college chapel from the slides? because they aren't modelled on the prototypical Christian church, given the importance the liturgical tradition has in pointing to objective truth, is the church formally doing anything about this? It seems careless to allow ill-formed architects to build our churches. Um, that's the first question. Um, I don't know if I have to read the second one. In a, a nice big question. Just one more, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, we live in funny times. Um, th there are so many of these sorts of things happening in our church. Our church is a, a very strange creature. It accommodates all sorts of strange things. Um, I do not resile from the fact that I call that architecture blasphemous because it is untruthful, it tells lies, it is, it is dependent upon lying. It has Corinthian columns which are um, concrete, um, steel encased um, concrete that have been shaped into a, a Corinthian column. For goodness sake, you know, you can imagine the, the original architect of the, that used the um, orders what they would think of that. They would think you were on a different planet. Where are these people coming from? What are they trying to do? Architecture must be of its time and place. It must use what it, what it has at its disposal, but do so in a way to fully recognise that we are body, mind and spirit, and that the world too is body, mind and spirit. Okay, um, and the second question was, uh, for the sake of avoiding Google Maps and in the spirit of worshipping locally, do you have any examples of Catholic churches modelled off the prototypical Christian church in Sydney that we can visit? No. <laughs> um, that having been said, that having been said, um, we, we will take our prejudices with, with us wherever we go. There have been some valiant attempts um, to do fine architecture in, uh, when modernism was not the dirty word that it's become. Um, there's one church which a lot of people hate because of its brutalist style, 
which is the uh, church out in, um, where is it, not, not, not Ride, but up that way. Great heavy concrete thing which has a cruciform shape and um, the architect was trying very hard to, to, to do the right thing. But, um, no, there, there are not yet. I'm putting a plea out, I'm putting a plea out there for the architects that are going to pick this up and run with it and, and make the architecture that we need. Excuse me, sorry, this might be a little bit controversial, but with the minds of people today, I mean, really, why is what you're saying so important in that if, if we can just still even as ugly as it may be or as, you know, distasteful or as wrong or as, you know, if we can still, you know, surely that the spirit of actually, rather than judging and that sort of thing, I mean, surely we just want to bring people to Jesus and why are you so focused? I mean, I appreciate your striving for excellence. I think it's very noble and very wonderful, but really at the end of the day, we want to bring souls to Jesus. And if people are trying their hardest to build a church and that's sort a of thing, and really surely it's just bringing someone to say, wow, this is, I feel comfortable here. And after all, today's people, we're a bit mixed up as it is, you know what I mean? So, why? I mean, it's wonderful. Maybe you're just striving for excellence, but surely, are you missing, with all absolute respect, are you missing the point of Jesus when you talk like this? If, if beauty is the attractive power of truth, and that's something that I absolutely firmly um, am committed to, if that's the case, then I'm going to call out error wherever I see it. But at the same time, beauty is everywhere, in everything that we encounter. I had, I had the pleasure of giving a lecture um, at the university uh, years ago, which I called Reflections uh, on Beauty. And I thought quite a lot about that before I gave it, and I chose a lot of really interesting images. One of them was the beautiful, beautiful multicoloured um, thing. The light was fracturing and looking absolutely beautiful. I had taken a close-up photograph of the oil slick on a puddle in a car park. Um, stepping back from the puddle and seeing where it was and seeing the ugliness of the surrounded, but nevertheless the beauty of the light refracting through that oil slick was Wonderful. We can see beauty anywhere we look. It is everywhere we look. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we must turn to truth first and foremost. And we must judge things as best we can. Are they true? Is this true? Thank you for your talk. Um, I was just interested in how you might balance the, I suppose, competing uh, tendencies of the church to proclaim sort of like universal principles, Catholicism, of course, proclaiming for all times and all peoples, and the kind of particularism you seem to be suggesting when you were saying we need to, for example, follow the example of our indigenous um, predecessors in this in this land, or, or indeed co-inhabitants. Um, there's, I mean, your talk then very much focused on eternal principles of number, of form, and ratio there. How far are those two really reconcilable in practice, given your, how shall I put it, pessimism over the last 700 years? I don't know, to be honest. I, I, I don't know. But um, if I can reflect for a moment on um, some words that I heard once from... Um, probably the, can I say the greatest composer of the 20th century, Messiaen, can I say that? He said, um, he said, uh, when I compose, I ask two questions. Is it necessary? And is it to be meaningful? 
He asks those before he sets off on any, t on any journey. Uh, but that's really all we need to do. If we are serious about taking the challenge that's offered, we've got to be conscious, really committed to answering those questions. Is it necessary that we do this? What is necessity? What is need? And then, how can we make things meaningful? How do we speak to the human condition? How do we... I don't know. I don't know. That there are so many questions there. I don't know how to do it. All I know is that we've got to try. Uh, interesting, Harry. Um, David will be giving the presentation. I know, that's why I raised the okay, yes. yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, look, we're running out of time. We can have one more question. Um, To uh, the uh, Romanesque or the early Gothic, yes, Sharps Cathedral. Go to Sharps anytime you like. It's uh, it has everything. Um, look, there have been some valiant attempts uh, in our in our time that have uh, failed for various reasons, but which are nevertheless joyous things. I think of the um, of the uh, Cathedral um, Christ the Light in Oakland, California, where the architect has endeavoured to take the Vesica Pisces as a starting point and has used the image of Christ taken from the door of Chartres Cathedral and has transformed that into a modern um, perforated uh, sh sheet of steel with this image on it bringing the materials of the, of the moment, of the age, right up to, the, up to now and dealing with um, light in a very um, creative way. But if I put him to the, to the serious tests that I would put um, any such uh, architecture or uh, endeavour, um, it would be found wanting, but nevertheless a terrific effort. And there are lots of others too, but... Everything's falling short. Mm. Uh, thank you, Harry. Uh, look, just, just uh, to, in, to wind up um, our presentation today, um, Harry and I are in our twilight years as architects, so we'll be exiting left door and... Um, uh, I guess within the next uh, so many years. We've got a number of young architects here today, which is fantastic, which is the, the next step um, in the progression towards what is beautiful in architecture. And as Harry was saying, that there is order. Um, the, the essential order is an essential ingredient of beautiful architecture. The other thing that I might say to the young architects and to all of you here, that look, the divine inspiration is absolutely paramount uh, so that our Lord works through us as his instruments. And that to do that, we have to be docile to the Holy Spirit. And docility comes from, you know, okay, trying to be a better person practicing the virtues, particularly the virtue of humility and prayer, so that the divine can work through us, so that we are then in his world and can produce the beautiful things. So that's our sort of parting um, sort of direction for, for the youth as they sort of move through their ed education. So thank you once again, Harry, for a, a wonderful presentation. I call on Father John to give us a blessing. Um, we didn't start with a prayer um, this afternoon, but 
the idea is that we'll finish with the prayer uh, so that the beauty of what we have ahead of us will lead us out and lead us on and lead us to beautiful things. So, as Harry was saying, the mother of our blessed Lord, um, the author of beauty, it's appropriate that we say the Hail Mary to lead us on to the world of beauty. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, my mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So, Father John, to give us uh, our departing blessing. Just some very brief comments before the blessing. I grew up in Brisbane, and as a young man, I remember being absolutely disgusted with them turning the beautiful treasury building on the corner of Queen Street and the quay into a casino. There were probably Catholics involved in that decision. Um, coming a bit further south to Armidale, I was there for a few more, some of us, you know, on... Uh, Friday, and um, in some of those country towns, and Armidale is a, a great example, the spire of the cathedral is still from all parts of the town uh, visible, and the cathedral is easily the most impressive building. Bridget said something about the sacramentality in that smallest sense of sacrament in God's creation. God is present in his creation. His imminence is at the heart of his creation. Therefore, his creation is beautiful. Maybe, um, maybe in the city we don't see that um, so often, but we've, we have seen a beautiful blue, blue sky. We've never seen the sky so consistently blue in, in Sydney in 2020, perhaps because we haven't been trashing our God-given creation to the extent that we normally do because of COVID. Um, but I was thinking, even in Surrey Hills, this church is the most beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's still the most impressive structure anyway. I think that is important, uh, with all due respect to what uh, the lady was saying earlier. Um, Yes, God is present at the heart of his creation, but not to the extent that he's present in the Blessed Sacrament. And the Mass is still the greatest thing that happens on this earth. Now it's only appropriate that we do our best to house the Blessed Sacrament, to create buildings in which the Mass is celebrated, to the best of our ability. And, and that's, that's why architecture is, is so important um, for the church and for the wider society. I think with everything that's been said, we might also say that the glory be. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and it shall be world without must bring a stall for the next two Sundays. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady of the Way, pray for us as we go out. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, Harry. Okay, well, we'll see you next Sunday. We don't see you before.